think of such an amazing project in the past few years. So let's go to the Wildlife Crime Academy. The Wildlife Crime Academy is an initiative or a joint collaboration between the regional government of Andalusia or Junta de Andalusia, the Central Ministry in Madrid for Ecological Transition and the Vulture Conservation Foundation. And of course, it's supported by the European Commission Life Program. So what is the Wildlife Crime Academy? The Wildlife Crime Academy is actually a simple training program that is uh, working on international scale and is tending to provide specialization in investigation, forensic pathology and toxicology of wildlife crime. We are pretending that wildlife crime is investigated exactly as any other crime is investigated, in the, investigated in the countries following all these uh, formal procedures for criminal investigation of prostitution. So what we have done until now, uh, actually this started two years ago and we have implemented different cohorts or training courses for the corresponding cohort. And this project or this initiative is not so much about vultures or birds or wildlife, it's more about people. It's the people that are actually According to national legislation, they are the responsible for investigation and fighting of wildlife crime. So uh, I will try to guide you through the different uh, uh, academic program or content that we have in the level one and level two course. So there is a theoretical part, of course, but we do have a practical part as well. We try to actually everything that we say to, to present and to make participants a closer contact with methods, scenarios, and everything that is related to wildlife crime. All of the professors are actually from Spain, mostly from the regional government of Andalusia and from the national police, uh, national Spanish police. And these are people that actually doing criminal investigation of cases as their daily job. They are not scared to share their mistakes. So make sure that uh, people don't need to spend uh, so many years in improving techniques and methods in order to conduct a uh, good quality criminal investigation. And we are talking about uh, forensic analysis and ID uh, of causes of death on the scene. So it's very important that people that are actually doing uh, conducting the, the investigation in the field have a, at least an idea or a picture on what have happened in that criminal scene. Then there is a CSI investigation. So we are talking about CSI uh, methods that are used in the investigation of any crime, actually. But here we are talking about the applicability of this criminal scene investigation methods in wildlife crime investigation. But then we are moving to the forensic labs where the magic ha happens, actually. Then we move to a, a weapon and ammunition. As mentioned in the beginning, Wildlife Crime Academy is not about illegal poisoning only, but it's also considering poaching and illegal shooting. So there is a class uh, talking about weapons and ammunition that is relevant for wildlife crime. Then there is an interesting talk as well about the body language. You know that uh, working in the field, we are not only finding dead animals, but we do have interaction with local people and uh, interviews and communication with local people can be extremely beneficial for the investigation process. So here in this class, we learn how to approach these local people and how to actually get uh, the best information possible from the field and from the... Uh, then we move to a power lines and impact and assessment. Uh, collision and electrocution are a significant cause of death when we talk about wildlife or particularly birds. So uh, there is a two reasons why we have included uh, actually the, the lecture on electrocution and collision here in the Wildlife Crime Academy. First, because it's a significant mortality cause for birds. And secondly, that legislation is changing in countries like Spain, for example, electrocution and collision can be considered as a wildlife crime. Then after the theoretical part, we move to a more practical part and it's a workshop. There is a three different workshops. The first of them is actually focusing on body posture complex and here participants have opportunity actually to see and to touch the birds. These are birds coming from uh, wildlife recovery centers and have been used for the, uh, you know, the practical work of the training course. And, and here there is opportunity for participants to get more knowledge on, uh, on ballistics, on weapons and ammunition and how they can be manipulated, how they can be used 
actually in poaching or illegal illegal incidents related to wildlife crime and it's a quite interesting uh, opportunity for participants to get a closer contact to it when here we are talking about a proper collection of samples and proper collection of evidence from the field how they need to be packaged how they need to be shipped and how they need to be labeled in order to follow this important chain of custody procedure and then uh, at the very end, uh, the last day of the training course is actually taking place the exam. So these are the rotational crime scenes, and we have actually here the participants as a proper investigators in the field, trying to determine the cause of that and trying to actually get uh, some preliminary thoughts on what have happened there and what was the, the, the actually the idea of the, of the, of the scene level two courses more advanced techniques in investigation so uh, we start the session uh, with the theory and we are talking about methods and upgrading the job how we can improve what are the advanced techniques in wildlife crime investigation and how we should learn from the mistakes we're talking about toxic compounds and toxic specific signs so this is uh, coming uh, kind of info from the lab that uh, helps to the to the people from the field to identify the different poisoning compounds that can be expected in poisoning incident. Here we are talking about the ballistic investigation of cases and how this can be actually uh, uh, investigated in labs or you can get some clues uh, from, the, from the field evidences that were collected. And uh, here there is a very nice talk on what kind of mistakes can be done during the investigation process and how we can prevent them. Then there is a, another talk about operative investigation of, of cases. Then we move to the crime scene investigation. This is a CSI investigation. And then we move to the different methods that can be used into the investigation processes like the canine units, the dogs that you all know, then the drones, the task forces, and every kind of methods that can be useful into the investigation. Participants are divided in two groups. We do in, divide them in the more enforcement group and more laboratory work so uh, while the enforcement group is more focused on csa investigation the laboratory work is more focused on the forensic laboratory uh, issues then uh, it's very important the interpretation of the toxicology results it's not only you know it's not only provide a number but also we need to relay these numbers with the, within the bigger picture of the criminal investigation and prove that this animal not only that consumed this toxic compound, but also this, that this toxic compound was the cause of death. We talk about introduction of the criminal signature. This is a quite advanced uh, method in the, in the criminal investigation. And here uh, participants are able to actually learn on how to identify criminal signatures and how to to actually make theories on what have happened in the scene. It's talking about international organized crime, in particularly highlighting the moment that sometimes the wildlife uh, criminal cases can look a bit irrelevant, you know, or people can have a, an attitude that is not giving them so much importance if it's about uh, poisoning or killing of few common birds, but this can actually be linked to a much larger uh, organized crime. In level two, we do have workshops, and in this case, we are focusing on forensic entomology and actually explaining how uh, insects can play a crucial role in the criminal investigation of the case. Then we do have a, a, a CSI general workshop that is talking about how we use fingerprints, and same as in level one, they are actually divided in groups and are investigating a, a very real criminal scenes. We call this very real criminal crime scenes simply because uh, the difference here between the level one course is that we are introducing the human component here and we are trying to get the best of use of the body language. You remember the body language classes and to see how investigators are actually interacting with locals and trying to, to collect as much as possible information from the field relevant to the criminal investigation. So this is all about level one and level two courses. Level three haven't been implemented yet, but after uh, February and March, I will be happy to share everything that's uh, happened in the level three courses. Next steps. 
Next steps is happy to say that only a few weeks ago, we submitted the new life project that is precisely about the wildlife crime Academy and this new project, if approved, uh, it will actually try to implement four different cohorts starting from 2004, 2024. And as target countries, in this case, we have Portugal, Slovenia, Montenegro, Georgia, North Cyprus, Lebanon, Egypt, Tunis, and Morocco. And uh, the objective is that we train more uh, hundred uh, governmental representatives more and, uh, and create capacities in all these countries to properly investigate criminal wildlife crime. Thank you so much. I Hi everyone, this is Laila Aktay from Turkey. I'm going to talk about our study of birds caused by the power grid in the southern part of Turkey. And this region is uh, Çukurova Basin mainly, and we did uh, our survey in Adana and Mersin uh, provinces. And this, this part is very important for bird migration and important hotspots and bottleneck uh, in the western Palearctic especially for soaring uh, migratory birds. It holds a very rich uh, geographical diversity from alpine to coastal zone, uh, along with being an important bottleneck. The region around Gulf of Iskenderun is the last stop for migratory birds, which fly through both main flyways before they continue to their journey through uh, Rift Valley to Africa. And uh, we conducted our surveys in southern Turkey around Mersin and Adana for 15 days in uh, September and October uh, 2019. We carried out the surveys myself and Özgün Sözer and our local breed dog Tina, which we trained it for wildlife surveys. The power lines to visit were pre preliminary chosen based on, the st on their structure and the risk it imposes to birds. And also, uh, we used the data provided by telemetry studies, especially uh, the places frequently visited by the Egyptian vulture. And we used the standard methodology of the life project. We entered our data on a daily basis using survey one, two, three. And then we mainly did power land surveys with six instructions in total length of 175 kilometers. We visited seven dive dump sites, had meetings with the electricity company. We also conducted some interviews with the locals while doing the surveys. And we used our dog, which we use for wildlife surveys, and we are still continuing to train it. Um, we used these traditional local hunting dogs because they because of uh, their prey drive and hunting skills that helps us to train them for conservation and for science you can see it during the uh, surveys and in total we found 59 individuals of six species two of them were egyptian vultures one of them was tracked by ron efrad and you could see the others were mainly white storks and the main reason for the both uh, Egyptian vultures, uh, the main reason that killed them was a typical small distribution line pole with a metal crossbar and propped up insulator jumpers. This is another victim and hazardous power lines. We identified them and classified them during our surveys. You could see some pictures of them here. We evaluated uh, them on the risk on birds. And we interviewed the locals to gather more information and heard from them about the victims they have witnessed. And we visited uh, seven dump sites, especially two of them were really, um, they had many victims around the pylons. And now the company has been insulating them based on our report. Yeah, the meetings were conducted with Energy Synergy and Toros Loredash for Mersin and Adana. We conducted five meetings back and forth and we kept uh, communication. Then we supported the team technically to develop an internal project for safe flyways for migratory birds. It was supported and being implemented. They started to do uh, installations before the live projects and they still continue. 
uh, such uh, case studies uh, helps them to uh, identify the hotspots that are really important to be insulated as soon as possible. We have two recommendations about such studies. Uh, the study should overlap with the peak time of migration. This will increase the probability of finding fresh victims and also better considering local specificities can improve the efficiency of data collection. And also these hotspots, the identified hotspots should be um, insulated as soon as possible and more surveys are needed and improving communication and cooperation with institutions and organizations is uh, needed for better conservation efforts. These are some pictures from our surveys and thank you for your attention. Good evening all. My name is Nikos Siopelas. I work for HOS, which is Bird Life Greens. I'm currently the coordinator of HOS for the Life Bonelli Estimate Project. I would like to start by thanking the conference organizers for the invitation. I also thank all the colleagues that have contributed in the making of this presentation, especially Vladimir Dobre from Bulgaria. So today we're going to present you two parallel actions that were implemented in two different projects in Greece and Bulgaria, but had the same purpose. Uh, in both cases, web-based tools and sensitivity maps were developed in order to mitigate disturbance risk caused by climbing activities. A small introduction regarding the vertical rock walls and their ecology. The vertical rock walls constitute one of the most unique ecosystems in our neighborhood. Because cliffs are in general inaccessible, uh, they are considered uh, relatively safe from human-induced alteration, or at least they used to be considered as such until recently. Uh, the last decades, the human interaction and in the rock wall cliff ecosystem is getting more and more intense, and it varies from quarries and touristic development up to sport activities like climbing. All these activities are causing habitat uh, degradation at uh, different levels. And in many, many cases, they pose obstacles to the conservation of local avifauna and especially some endangered and rare species. Uh, during the implementation of our two life projects, we focused on the conflict between climbing and the two target species of Egyptian vulture and the Bonelli seagull. But we think that these two species can play the ro role of an umbrella for all the other rock dwellers that are concerned in this ecosystem. Most of the people have a fixed, almost a stereotypic image of a scenery when they hear the term cliff or vertical rock wall. Most of us are tending to think of high alpine walls covered with snow and ice. Well, practically, this is not the case in the Mediterranean, let's say, landscape. In our neighborhood, we can divide the rock wall cliffs depending on their bioclimatic zone. So we have the coastal rock walls that host different species, such as the Eleonora's falcon. We have the inland rock walls of low and medium altitude that are hosting most of the, of the raptor species, such as the Egyptian vulture and the Bonelli seagull. And lastly, we have the high altitude rock walls that have specialized birds, such as the beautiful tree creeper or other alpine species. Despite their uniqueness and their very known value, the ecosystems of the rock wall cliffs are poorly surveyed, are understudied. So we don't have more than a handful of studies to work with. And in many, many cases, we had to improvise or to make compromises. And of course, when we are thinking of protecting an environment such as the rock wall cliff uh, walls, uh, we have to remember that apart from the birds, there are several other taxa that might be severely affected, including, of course, flora, and a lot of the endemic species are uh, resident on the walls, and mammals such as bats. So, let's say how the whole planet is dealing with this issue. As we can see at the map, the countries that are mostly concerned about the environment and also have developed uh, the culture of climbing 
are the ones that have made the first steps towards the solution of the problem. But depending on the country and depending on the, on the special needs they have in each locality, the way that they treat the problem is slightly different. So let's say in the United States, they have the ability to close very big areas. And the United Kingdom, because their databases are very large, they have the luxury to be very, very specific. And in France, because they have probably the most developed climbing uh, culture and the biggest climbing community of all countries, they have to be quite specific at their uh, restrictions. Some of these things are not really applicable in the two countries that we are working at. So, in brief, decision making uh, is greatly varying between countries. And nobody can say uh, that it is always successful. We are aware of some cases, even in these countries of the Western world, that the restrictions did not have the weighted uh, results. So let's see the methodologies that were followed both in Bulgaria and Greece. Let's start with the approach that the colleagues in Bulgaria had. So the data for the nesting sites of endangered and sensitive species of uh, uh, raptors on cliffs, the database uh, belong to the BSPB, were used as the first step. Around the nesting sites, a buffer, the, the size of which was dependent on the species, uh, was created. Then uh, two more layers were uh, used. The one was the protected areas layer and the other the climbing sectors. So in the final product, we had a combination of all of these four pools of data, let's say, and the result was to highlight the areas where the danger was imminent and the disturbance was really, really uh, important. All these results were communicated through the website of the climbing guide for Bulgaria. Let's see what we did in Greece. In Greece, we did not have to deal with the whole of the country, but just with the, the areas where the Bonelli Eagle project is working at. So we had the luxury to be a little more detailed. We chose to do a multi-criteria analysis in order to express risk levels and to present, in, present them according to the, to the traffic light indicator system, this one, which we expect to be easily understandable by the, the general public. So what we did, in fact, was to combine two axes. The first one was the probability of disturbance and the second one was the severity of the impact that we expected. And uh, give, uh, multiply these two values and give a final value which would be related to one of the three colors. So the green, low impact, medium impact with the orange color and high impact in very, very severe or even critical situations when you have a very, very big probability of damage, which will cause a very, very severe impact. Uh, I will not get into detail. Uh, we can do it in the Q&A section later. Uh, just in brief, you can see uh, some of the criteria used. Uh, let's say disturbance is different regarding the species or the, regarding the topography, the distance, let's say, to the nest. And of course, the impact criteria is different because it's more serious to expect displacement of a pair of eagles in comparison to slight habitat degradation from the visitors. But I have to stress that we were in need of a fourth color and this color would address the situations which we were unable to get risk level decision. So we incorporated the fourth color, the gray one, for cases where the risk level is unknown and we suggest the climbers to be really, really cautious or even don't go there. And of course, we prioritize these areas for our field work. The way of presentation of this tool to the climbing community was a web-based uh, map. It's, as you see, you can zoom in at these climbing areas and you can go down to the sector level. The sector in climbing is these small areas that have from a few up to tens of fruits and are very clearly defined areas. So we have a common language with the climbers 
and we can have an incrimination of the site easily. Also, this size of area is convenient for us because we don't have to be very accurate with the nesting sites for safety reasons, but it's quite accurate if we have to have input of data from the climbers or even to incorporate the sectors in our protocols uh, regarding our field work. Restrictions by this web tool in Greece are not mandatory. This is not legislation. In the majority of the cases, uh, we have a very good cooperation with the climbing society and the community in general. So we are expecting that the climbers who are studying this web tool are going to respect the suggestions that we made. And also I forgot to tell you that we have two different options that user can choose between two different seasons, the breeding one and the non-breeding one, because the impact level uh, of the risk is changing dramatically between these two seasons. Let's say how we communicated in each country the products. In Bulgaria, meetings with the climbing clubs were implemented. They, they developed guidelines for responsible and bird-friendly behavior uh, in the cliffs. And uh, they introduced seasonal restrictions in different climbing sectors. The Bulgarian Climbing and Albinism Federation uh, was playing a major role in all this communication process. So they have web uh, sites talking about their web tool. This is the guideline in Bulgarian. And also these are some of the restrictions that were posed in areas that were really sensitive to human disturbance. In Greece, it was more or less the same in Greece. We had all these meetings with the local uh, clubs in order to spread the word. And uh, also we developed, we printed info material and uh, we cooperated at national level with the Greek Climbing Federation in order to find, you know, the proper channels to get our message further. Some of our products were these and also I would like to say that we also had a very serious uh, case where we had to put some uh, restriction uh, in cooperation with the local authorities and we also took the chance to form a very very nice team of uh, volunteer climbers that are helping us out in research by you know going to places where we could never go using their skills. Some conclusions and the relevant suggestions from them are that climbing is on the rise, especially after COVID, so we have to take measures. The impacts are widely accepted and potentially harmful. We all know that, and it is also accepted by the climbing community. National legislation is not sufficient, so we have to improve this as well and uh, the restrictions can significantly, significantly reduce the risk. But most of all, education and information of the users, the stakeholders, the climbers is of principal importance for the successful protection of the rock wall ecosystems and the birds in there, because nobody can have total control of all the, the rocks in one country. So some suggestions that are deriving from this is that the potential impacts must be recognized by all the relevant parties. The cooperation between scientists, authorities, the climbing community, everybody interested has to go on and improve further. And of course, we have to have more information and uh, more insight in the problem. So that's all from us. I want to thank you very much. And of course, we are open to any questions that you might have in the next uh, session of the Q&A. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alex Ngari. I work for BirdLife International. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. <coughs> and I will be talking to you about a very interesting project that we've been implementing for almost 10 years now. Uh, a project uh, whose uh, main focus has been migratory soaring birds. Um, we've been doing mainstreaming work within the Rift Valley Red Sea flyway region. Um, 
I'm not alone in this project and uh, we have been implementing it with uh, several colleagues and um, I'll be speaking to on their behalf today uh, about this, this, this project. So this is my outline for the short presentation that I'm going to make. Uh, I'll provide a little bit of background about the project at the region the conservation challenges that have been trying to address and the sectors, the sectors that have been mainstreaming um, and our approach and I'll be sharing with you some of the uh, success, success stories or achievements that we made over the period. So welcome. So uh, for some background, um, uh, this regional focus is actually a very important region uh, for migratory birds because uh, the we have about 1.5 million uh, migratory birds that use this migratory corridor to move between Eurasia and Africa. Uh, uh, five uh, globally threatened species uh, use this migratory corridor uh, some, and some that seven species have been labeled as having unfavorable conservation status by CMS. That five species are on the uh, CITES list and we have about 23 globally important bottleneck sites within the region, making this migratory corridor uh, the second most important uh, flyway uh, corridor for the migratory southern birds in the world. Uh, the sectors and uh, the challenges that I've been addressing is about the impact that the human development sectors uh, are having on migratory birds. And these sectors um, are hunting, energy waste management, uh, agriculture, and we've picked, you know, ecotourism. Uh, promoting the uh, ecotourism activities to benefit the migratory soaring birds. Agriculture, energy, uh, waste management and hunting sectors are some of the sectors that uh, BirdLife and UNDP identified as having, you know, the most important threat to migratory soaring birds in this region and therefore We've been partnering with uh, UNDP to better the practices in this sector, in these sectors. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'll be focusing on the energy sector uh, in this in this region. And um, to describe the energy sector, I really like using this map of Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia is positioned herself to be a power hub of energy generation to supply its neighbors with, with power. And uh, as you may be aware, this region uh, hosts some of the fastest developing countries in the world. And uh, it is impossible to actually develop without having power. So power sector becomes a key sector in the region and um, when power infrastructure is poorly planned, when power infrastructure is poorly deployed, it has huge impacts on migratory soaring birds. You remember these are the big body birds which are, you know, easily affected by our infrastructure uh, um, uh, as they go about the, uh, you know, uh, uh, routine business. So that is where we come in. And um, as, as we speak, uh, this, this, this plan by Ethiopia is actually becoming a reality. Ethiopia is already exporting power to Kenya. And uh, we've been approached by the World Bank to help them to better the, uh, the safeguard measures when they start constructing the interconnection between Ethiopia 
and Djibouti. So uh, there are plans to also expand um, power from Ethiopia southwards. And uh, of course, exporting power all the way to, to, to Egypt is, is almost a reality. So this is a really a very important sector uh, that uh, we chose to, to, en to engage in. So um, some of the approaches that Badlaf has been using to mainstream or to, uh, you know, achieve for migratory birds in the power sector has been one of them to uh, develop uh, support tools to make, you know, mainstreaming possible. Tools that are, that are uh, you know, um, and aimed at uh, to better the, the practices of the sector uh, because we realize that uh, it is not possible to ask the stakeholders to do certain things yet they do not know how to do them. So we had to develop, for example, a suite of guidelines. We had to develop a, a sensitivity mapping tool which has now been expanded to cover the whole of North Africa, um, to cover also Kenya, but also to cover a big portion of Middle East. So um, uh, uh, the project has a number of, you know, even stakeholder uh, customized tools uh, targeting specific stakeholders. We've been building our knowledge uh, through data gathering um, and analysis especially to map, you know, a, a hotspots uh, where bars are being negatively affected by the energy infrastructure. We have also been intervening on the policy arena, both globally and nationally. We've been supporting active mitigation measures uh, uh, for the turbines and also power lines. And this is basically for demonstration purposes because we realize that uh, the energy birds problem is a widespread problem across the region and it is impossible for the project to be everywhere. So what we've been doing is really uh, showing the stakeholders that it is actually possible to connect people without damaging the environment while preserving birds. Um, we have also been engaging in active uh, education and awareness creation activities including sharing of lessons like we are doing today. And we've also been promoting partnerships within stakeholders. It is impossible to do mainstreaming work without bringing, you know, stakeholders together on a table to discuss actions. And this project has been very, very successful in doing this. We brought, um, you know, stakeholders together, national utilities, NGOs, and private sector into signing of MOUs uh, through which um, uh, you know mainstreaming is possible. We produced national and also regional guidelines and uh, mapped you know uh, dangerous areas which where birds are being affected. Um, we promoted active turbine management, uh, including shutdown and demand measures. We've been able to retrofit dangerous power lines, build capacities between, within stakeholders and created awareness across the board. Um, uh, these are just uh, some of the achievements or successes that I've been able to uh, speak about today. And in case you need some more information about the project, you can actually access uh, that information through the address provided on this last slide. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. My name is Tela Egbe and I lead the species program of the Nigerian Conservation Foundation. I'll be speaking to you on identifying and addressing local threats to vulture populations in Nigeria. This is a summary of the work that NCF has been doing to reverse the trends of vulture populations in Nigeria and to continue to protect and preserve remnant species nationwide.
So for about a decade, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation has monitored the trends in vulture populations as there have been rapid declines observed globally. As part of these efforts, and with the support of the Egyptian Vulture Life Project, NCF has been involved in research, advocacy, capacity building, community collaborations and interventions at various levels to ascertain the levels of this decline. Species of vultures that have been observed over these years include the hooded vulture, the rupel griffin vulture, Egyptian vulture, white-backed, white-headed and the lappet-faced vultures. The vulture conservation activities were based on the following objectives to reduce the demand of illegally traded vulture parts by 50% in the country, to improve and increase capacity and collaboration between special criminal investigation agencies involved in monitoring illegal trade in wildlife um, across the country, and to implement the African Eurasian Multi-Species Action Plan, um, which vulture is a major part of true public awareness and the vulture safe zone strategy. So from the nationwide survey that was carried out, um, the reasons for vulture declines were found to include indiscriminate killing of vultures, killing for use in traditional medicine and habitat loss. Areas um, where vultures still occur were also identified and these areas were marked and uh, measured based on priority for the vulture safe zone um, project. The demand for vulture and vulture parts in traditional medicine, um, market surveys were carried out to understand the quantity, value, and the types of vulture and vulture parts being used and being traded on. And in 2019, three major markets were surveyed, um, Ogun State, Oyo State, both of which are located in the southwestern part of the country, and Kano State, which is in the northern part of the country. Part of all this survey also revealed that, apart from being a source for vultures, Nigeria is also a trade point, and um, uh, vultures are being brought in from other West African countries and they are sold here in, in Nigeria. So these vulture species that were encountered in this market include the hooded vulture, the lappet faced vulture, and the white-backed vulture. Another activity conducted to reduce the demand for illegal vultures was to conduct a baseline survey on the perception and attitude of consumers, traditional healers, and traders of wildlife products, and what influences their beliefs surrounding the illegal trade in vultures and their body parts. Um, also, a stakeho stakeholders uh, meetings were held to identify viable and sustainable options um, to vulture and vulture parts being used in traditional based uh, medicine. Three, in total, three stakeholders workshops were held. Um, 200 members were directly reached and more of that um, indirectly. And then these plant based alternatives were also suggested. So other activities carried out to reduce the demand of vulture and vulture part by 50% include identifying and collaborating with stakeholders in the value chain of traditional medicine. Um, this includes organs of government that are responsible um, for regulating the kind of drugs that are released into the market. One of such organizations is the Nigerian Food and Drug Administration. Um, they are responsible for approving drugs and release it and before the release into the market. Their mandates include restricting the use of animal parts in most of these medicines that are really re released into the market. So they are important stakeholders that have been involved in this process. Also in 2021, the Committee on Alternatives to Vulture Parts met to look at the cost, effectiveness, and accessibility of this um, plant-based alternatives that have been suggested in place of vultures and vulture parts and to come up with a final list of what um, can be embraced by their colleagues that are involved in this trade. So finally, after consultation with several stakeholders, um, in collaboration with the Nigerian Conservation Foundation, the traditional medicine practitioners um, released the book on plant-based alternatives to vulture and vulture parts in Nigeria, which has been seen as a very welcome development um, by these associations, um, owing to the fact that they are beginning to realize um, how unsustainable it is to continue to use vulture and vulture parts in, in their practices. They've also realized that um, in the line of their work, accessibility to this resource has become more difficult as the species have declined rapidly 
and you can no longer be obtained as easily as it used to. So this is a win-win um, for us as conservation, as conservationists, and for them as traditional medicine um, practitioners. So as part of its efforts to build capacity among organs of government that are in, involved um, in controlling the illegal trade in wildlife, the Nigerian Conservation Foundation worked with several organs of government, like the Nigerian Customs, the Nigerian um, Police, the Judiciary. Um, they were all brought together and they were trained um, on monitoring um, illegal wildlife trade, prosecuting illegal wildlife trade. And then through a multi-stakeholder engagement and alignment with the efforts of the UNODC, a five years national strategy on wildlife and forest crimes was finalized in December 2021 and launched in April 2022 in Nigeria. Um, during this engagement, one of the major achievements was that the Nigerian Customs Service was able to establish a special wildlife crime office, which has helped to develop and equip um, seized specimen storerooms across their sea and land borders. The staff of the Nigerian Customs Service in these wildlife crime offices have also undergone training um, in December 2021 on how best to combat wildlife crimes within the context of enforcement, investigations, and intelligence. The Nigerian Conservation Foundation was able to design and produce an, a user-friendly guide on Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act is a localized form of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. Um, this act um, helps in the control of illegal wildlife trade and the organs of government that are responsible for enforcing this locally include the Nigerian Police Force and the National Environmental Standard um, Regulations Enforcement Agency, NESRA, um, the Office of the Department of Public Prosecution. All of them were also, were, they were all a part of, of these workshops and um, they were trained on gathering information, intelligence, investigation, and proper prosecution um, of wildlife criminals. So from the nationwide survey that was carried out, remnant population of vultures were identified. Um, the most common species was the hooded vulture. And as at the time of this survey, um, it was estimated to have a population of 566 individuals are mostly occupying the southeastern and the south south part of the country. Um, the lappet faced vulture was not cited during the survey, um, but estimated population from desk reviews shows that we could still have about 39 individuals um, left in the wild. Um, all of these were those that were identified during the survey were marked for future action, especially um, considering the possibility of virtual safe zone as one of the efforts to protect these remnant populations. And considering the local factors and the quality of the community interactions, two sites have been prioritized for possible as possible um, areas for the virtual safe zone project. Um, these two sites are located in the southeastern part of the country. So the first site is AK Forest, located in Agu local government of Enugu State in Nigeria. This is a community forest in a community of about 25,000 people. The second community is in Anambra State. Um, it's called Aka Ekiti, and it's a cosmopolitan area with semi-urban population. Um, it has a large market and with slaughterhouses that serve as food resources for vultures within this zone. So building on past efforts, um, we'll continue to monitor uh, local and migratory vulture populations. Uh, we continue to make efforts to establish the vulture saving projects in the priority sites that have been identified. Um, continuous advocacy and then capacity building um, for all, everyone in the conservation chain for vultures and other um, wildlife. Um, thank you all for listening, and um, special thanks to the EV Life Project for supporting um, the efforts of NCF in the conservation of vultures so far. Hello, my name is Dilana Vasileva. I am here with my colleague Luka Vasileva, and today we are going to talk about security, securing 
of overhead power lines for bird protection. With growing industrialization and electrification of urban populations, overhead power lines and transmission distribution lines became a permanent element of the landscape in Europe over the past century. While already at the stage of planning the, and constructions, their significant negative impact on birds' habitat was foreseen. Such constructions were preferred as their cost was much cheaper compared to underground, underground cable lines. As a result, nowadays, majority of electricity transmission and distribution grids in Bulgaria and most of the U European countries are based on overhead power lines. Many studies evidencing that thousands of birds die due to electrocution or following a collision with overhead electric power lines annually. The main conflict between the electricity network and birds has two points of view. Collision with distribution network during flight and electrocution while the bird is using the electricity pole for resting, hunting or else. Electrocution generally takes place when birds are making a bridge between the pole and the lines while perching, flying away or defecating. The risk of electrocution increases with weather, humidity and precipitation. Collision occurs when birds are in flight and due to low visibility of the cables. Electroraspределение Yuk is a company part of the EVN group of companies which is part of the large family of the energy, energy concern EVN in Austria. EVN Era is an electricity distribution company operating in southeastern Bulgaria. The company has 34 client energy centers and operates and maintains nearly 60,000 kilometers of medium and low voltage networks in southeastern Bulgaria, of which only 10% are underground cable lines. As you can see on the map, a large part of the territory of the EVN era falls within the areas of the Natura 2000 network under the Bird Directive and the Habitats Directive. Intercompany sustainable policies and objectives, as well as the biodiversity regulations in at European level, led to reconsiderations of the term safe grid, not only from the perspective of safe delivery of electricity, but also taking into account the mitigation of bird mortality due to overhead power lines. The pilot activities for retrofitting power lines in Bulgaria started in 2009 with installing nesting platforms for white storks and insulations of medium and low voltage power lines. Retrofitting power lines to take the electric rig safe for birds is beneficial both economically and ecologically. On one hand, this guarantees technically stable transmissions and distribution process of electricity to the customers with re reduction of technological losses and much lower carbon footprint. On the other hand, this provides ecologically sustainable infrastructure with significantly lower risk for birds. By 2009 until now, we installed 2,973 white stork nest platforms. Initially, the insulation caps are installed on segments along the grid, while higher, where higher frequency of electric outages caused by perching and flying birds was detected. Since 2009, Era Yuk annually retrofits power lines in southeastern Bulgaria, applying plot pilot state of art at national level approaches. The, the collaborations uh, with BSPB in two, uh, started in 2011 uh, with insulating of additional 609. 95 electric poles, which resulted in mitigation the probability of electric shock in 80% of the nesting territories of the Imperial Eagle in Bulgaria. This catalyzed closer cooperation of the of, uh, between Era Yuk 
BSPB and different conservation projects. Uh, this catalyzed closer cooperation between ERAUK, BSPB and other NGOs and government organizations. And by 2021, this resulted in the insulation of additional 1500 electric poles under 10 different conservation projects, which you can see on these two slides. Moreover, uh, the last 12 years, ERAUK invested own resources for the installation of near 28,000 poles. Hi, my name is Kamen Nikov and I am a police officer in the animal police and zoology sector. This sector is part of Security Police Department under the umbrella of General Directorate National Police. The main functions of the sector are breeding and training service dogs for the needs of the Bulgarian police. In 2016, this sector is also dedicated to the prevention and investigation of crimes against animals. In 2022, I was appointed by the Minister of Interior as the chairman of an inter-institutional working group which was responsible for the creation of specialized structure in the Ministry of the Interior for combating crimes against the environment, wildlife and cruelty to animals. With changes in the penalty code in the Republic of Bulgaria, several categories of acts related to the protection of nature and the protection of animals from cruelty have been declared as crimes. For example, the destruction or damage of protected territories and habitats, the illegal destruction, damage, acquisition, possession or alienation of specimens of a protected species of wild, flora or fauna, the illegal destruction, damage, acquisition, possession or alienation of specimens of European or globally endangered wild vertebrates, organizing or participating in animal fighting, rising training or providing animals for fighting, cruelty to a vertebrate animal which caused its death, severe or permanent damage, the failure to exercise sufficient care over a vertebrate animal by a person under whose supervision the animal is, due to which the animal causes moderate, severe bodily injury or death to another person. In 2015, police officers were appointed with the responsibility to investigate this type of crime in each regional directorate of the police. In 2016, in the General Directorate National Police, Sector Animal Police and Synology was established. The police in investigation of crimes in the Republic of Bulgaria is regulated by three acts. The Criminal Code, which defines the concept of a crime, as well as defines specific socially dangerous acts, such as crimes. The Criminal Procedure Code, which defines the basic principles and procedure of conduct of criminal cases, method of proof, evidence, means of proof, etc. The law on the Ministry of Interior gives police authorities the power to investigate crimes. Authorities of the Ministry of Interior can also carry out administrative punitive activities under the law on forest, the law on hunting and game protection, and the rules for carrying out this activity are in accordance with the law on administrative violations and penalties. The slide shows the bodies that carry out control functions related to the prevention and counteraction of violations related to wild species. Each of these structures has specific powers. For example, General Directorate National Police carries out prevention and investigates crimes on the territory of the country, coordinating the activities of the regional directorates of the Ministry of Interior. General Directorate Border Police carries out border checks as well as guard the state border, investigates crimes in border areas and checkpoints. These two directorates are structures of the Ministry of the Interior. The Ministry of Environment and Water has other control bodies as follows. Directorate National Service for the Protection of Nature and the Waste Management and Soil Protection Directorate. 
The Ministry of Agriculture also has its control bodies. Bulgarian Food Safety Agency, Forestry Executive Agency and Fisheries and Aquaculture Executive Agency. When these authorities respond to a signal, it often turns out that they cannot solve the problem on their own and interaction with the others is obligatory. The first diagram shows the number of registered crimes related to damage, destruction or illegal possession of protected specimens of wild flora and fauna. The second diagram shows the number of registered crimes related to damage, destruction or illegal possession of specimens of European or globally endangered vertebrate species. The very low number of registered crimes is striking, which does not mean that they are not committed, but rather that the police don't receive reports of this type of crime, and they remain latent crimes. In a similar way, things look like with the situation with illegal animal fighting. The specific thing about this crime is that it is well organized because it is usually accompanied by illegal betting, which is another type of crime. Things look a little better for crimes related to cruelty to animals. The diagram clearly shows that since the establishment of the animal police and cyanology sector in the national police, the number of registered crimes, firstly, has started to increase, which is due to the promotion of the sector activities on the one hand, and on the other hand, public intolerance towards this type of acts is high. The more registered crimes there are, even with the same percentage of disclosure, the number of punished person is greater. As a result of convictions, after 2019, we observe a trend towards a decrease in the number of registered crimes. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic must be also taken into account. This is usually the case with foreign experience as well. <coughs> The institutions say we have no problem, or the problem is small, because we have no registered cases. But when the institutions become active, the number of registered cases increased substantially, in some cases dramatically. Main challenges are a high latency in crimes against protected species, difficult exchange of information between control bodies from different institutions, lack of coordination or poor co coordination in receiving, registering and responding to signals, need for training and building of capacity of control bodies, insufficient human resources in the territorial structures of the control bodies, difficult interaction between police authorities and authorities from other competent structures at night and on weekends and holidays. Solutions. National Action Plan to combat the illegal use of poisons into the wild, cooperation and capacity building, Ministry of Interior, Animal Police and Zoology Sector, NGOs as Bulgarian Society for Protection of Birds, Green Balkans, Association of Prosecutors in Bulgaria, WWF, and etc. Capacity building, training, and the University of Trace, Bulgaria, organized in cooperation with the Bulgarian Society for Protection of Birds, Green Balkans, with the participation of experts from regional relevant institutions. Interinstitutional working group to create a specialized unit in the Ministry of Interior for combating crimes against the environment, wildlife, and animals. Trainings of service dogs to search for poisonous bites in nature. Use of service dogs to search the, for poisonous bites are going to be introduced into the work of the police. The training in Trace University includes a theoretical and practical module at the Rescue Center of Green Balkans, where the participants had the opportunity to learn directly about specific signs of the carcasses of birds which can be quite lines for the causes of death. The training was useful not only because of the new knowledge and skills that the participants acquired, but mostly because of the personal contacts that were established between the representatives of the various institutions in the respective regions. Thanks to these contacts, a working team was formed very quickly which include the prosecutor, an investigative team from the police and representatives of the regional forest directorate. 
Effects of training are speed of reaction, creation of an interagency team to visit the scene of the accident, improved coordination between institutions, participation of a prosecutor in carrying out and an inspection of the scene of the accident, implementing best practices for recovering evidences from the crime scene, increasing motivation to work. Inter-institutional working group has uh, representatives of Parliament of the Republic of Bulgaria, Ministry of the Interior, Ministry of Environment and Water, Ministry of Agriculture, State Agency for National Security, Customs Agency, Trace University Stara Zagora, Association of Prosecutors in Bulgaria, Bulgarian Society for Protection of Birds, Green Balkans, WWF Bulgaria, and lawyer Emilia Tonchela. Interinstitutional Working Group Proposals Creation of a sector combating crimes against the environment, wild nature and animals in the General Directorate National Police Draft agreement between the Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Environment and Water and Ministry of Agriculture including the mechanism for cooperation in countering illegal encroachments Ensuring readiness for 24-7 response in all territorial structures of the control bodies determination of priorities and an administratively simplified procedure for interaction in high-risk incidents, creation of an interinstitutional coordination council and expert network contact points for information exchange, preparation of, of national strategies and planning of measures to optimize cooperation. Sector combating crimes against the environment, wild nature and animals, subject of activities. Prevention and counteraction of crimes related to protection of forests and habitats in protected areas or against protected species. Manifestation of particular cruelty towards animals, air, water and soil pollution, waste management. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi everyone. Great to be here with you. Um, my name is Liam Innes and I work for the Renewables Grid Initiative based in Berlin. Um, and today I'll be speaking to you briefly about TSO NGO collaboration for bird protection. Uh, just to start off with, I should say TSO stands for Transmission System Operators and NGO stands for Non-Governmental Organizations. So who is RGI? The Renewables Grid Initiative is a not-for-profit organization which is active at European level. In uh, 11 countries with our 25 members, we bring these un maybe unlikely partners together to push forward the energy transition and the electricity grid um, in the most sustainable, fair and transparent way possible. Um, for this, we work on the system integration of renewables, so technological innovation, communication, engagement, public participation, but most importantly for today and for my work, environmental protection. And clearly when it comes to the grid, one of the things we're talking about the most is bird protection. So at European level, then, we, we come up with principles, we highlight best practices and standards, and we organize events, conferences, webinars, workshops. But we also recognize that in order to really make a difference um, in the different member states, we have to cement national level partnerships um, where these organizations can um, really work together on a very concrete thing. And that's what we began to do in Germany um, with the bird portal. The bird portal started back in 2017 as a very simple endeavor to create an online uh, mask and phone line where anyone who is out walking in nature and finds a dead bird underneath the power line can report this. This data is then given to NABU, the German branch of BirdLife, uh, where an ornithologist there works through the data, establishes what um, species the bird is, um, how it died, if it was electrocution or collision. Um, this data is then passed to the grid operator and together we discuss this then. Um, what, how could this have happened? Why does some kind of uh, mitigation measure retrofitting need to happen now? Um, but it doesn't necessarily inform e individual um, retrofitting actions. More so, it's the idea is to build a kind of broader understanding of the scale of the problem in Germany. 
Um, we started off back in the day with uh, NABU and three TSOs. We are now working with four TSOs and three DSOs, DSOs standing for distribution system operators. Um, and these are the partners currently. Um, as well as being a project uh, based on gathering this data, it's also generally just a form for exchange and mutual learning between these partners. We clocked very early on that actually, although these guys all work on very similar topics, they don't necessarily exchange on uh, problematics such as bird protection. So that's a really important part of the project as well. But back to the data gathering, um, of course, it's a citizen science based approach. So we rely on members of the public um, putting in their, the, their finds, and this is the data that we find. Currently, we run about 50 records per year, which is not a massive number. Um, admittedly, there's not that much scientific validity to this uh, figure, but I think what it represents and the, the movement towards more awareness of this uh, problem is a really, really positive step. And it brings this up the agenda of the, the grid operators without question, I'd say. So aside from the portal itself, the project really gives us the opportunity to engage these partners on many different topics related to bird protection around the grid. And one of them where we're particularly active at the moment is bird markers. So visually marking the lines with physical pieces of equipment to prevent uh, bird mortality through collision when birds fly into mainly the earth wire. Um, and we've created then a working group on this where we bring together all the partners to exchange more regularly, to bring together the technical uh, colleagues who then share their experiences, positive and negative, with different sorts of bird markers, to give their priorities and criteria on what they need from a technical, from a grid safety point of view. But also, um, given that this is already a collaborative forum between civil society and industry, it offers itself very nicely as uh, a room where the producers of these bird markers can come together to discuss then priorities, ideas for new research, new markers, which could be even more effective. Aside from this, we're very active in terms of communication. So we've created, for example, a video uh, on this topic, which I can share in the chat. Um, a brochure which will be translated into nine languages and which we hope will raise more awareness among the public but also among public authorities, um, different bodies like this. And we hold regular workshops and conferences, for example this recent conference which we held in Dortmund um, where people from across the, the grid world uh, came together to discuss how they can collaborate in future more to yeah, tackle the project, the problem of bird mortality around the grid. There's much more than just that. We also talk to our partners on things like sensitivity mapping, on open data, on creating new exchange fora. Uh, we can gladly speak about this at another occasion. I'll leave my contact details. And that's all. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Louis Junior Saad. I am the project manager for the Egypt EV New Life project within SPNL, Society for the Protection of Nature in Lebanon. I'll be talking a bit about the APU and its work uh, regarding IKB. APU stands for the Anti-Poaching Unit, uh, which we have established a couple of years back, and it's work that has been done uh, specifically over the last two years in terms of achievements and uh, results that we have able to reach and its impact on uh, Lebanon as a whole. I will be starting with a small video which summarizes all of our work over the last couple of years, specifically 2021 and 2022, and what we have uh, done and implemented afterwards.
So basically, as a start, APU is built by the hunters, by responsible hunters. Usually the normal tradition is to really work from an environmental point of view, from environmentalists talking to hunters and poachers about really the negative impact of hunting and poaching. However, this has very limited results all over the world, not even Lebanon. And we all know that Lebanon really is a, is a massacre or a black spot along the flyway. For that matter, Espanel has really shifted its way of thinking and radicalized the concept of really spreading awareness of our on IKB by utilizing and really in, uh, enriching the knowledge uh, of responsible hunter, uh, hunters and really showcase if, how, how a hunter could be responsible and uh, they are a key role player in conserving the nature. And thus, these responsible hunters, they can really spread awareness to other hunters and poachers to reduce the IKB or disastrous situation that Lebanon has been passing through for ages regarding hunting. So m many of our, our work has been done on three pillars, field activities, awareness activities, stakeholder mapping and communication, where we have done anti-poaching reconnaissance, we have worked on bird release, on bird rescue and rehab, sustainable hunting and hunting law, awareness activities, off-season activities, and working with local authority and through advocacy campaigns. We have, uh, within the t uh, field activities, we were able to transfer knowledge to other partners, other NGOs, uh, and uh, governmental bodies. When our work, we were able to purchase uh, equipment and uh, cameras to our uh, staff members, and we were able to do bird rescue trainees. Uh, we, have, we were able to do a training for the law enforcement uh, agencies in Lebanon that focus on apprehending uh, poachers. Adding to that, we have done meetings with high-ranking officials within the ISF uh, and Internal Security Forces Special Operations Unit on how to really bridge the gap between our work and their work and really how to do proper communication and apprehending poachers and really spread awareness where we have able, we're able to reach a level where we are now able to, we were able to present a training course within the cadet, a cadet unit of the ISF or a cadet compound of the ISF on uh, environmental awareness and about sustainable hunting and responsible hunting. We, are, we were able to do off-season activities regarding wildlife, wildlife photography, and we are now working on a track shooting. Uh, we have distributed rescue booklets, or specifically a very technical booklet about how to transport and rehabilitate uh, injured vultures, and a uh, hunting law and booklet uh, for responsible hunters, and we have a continuous coordination with the ISF and legal same time, we were able to do over 70 patrols within the black spot areas along the flyway. We were able to purchase over 10 binoculars, which really have an added value, which supported the APU in terms of identifying uh, poachers and off-season activities through bird watching. Uh, during the migration season, we were able to purchase uh, cameras for them to document the proper uh, IKB cases and to be utilized as well if need be in the uh, wildlife uh, photography as an off-season activity. We, one of the uh, additional activities we have done is training on bird uh, first aid procedures and bird rescue with uh, to our staff members or to the APU specifically, which has been done primarily by BSPB and Green Balkans, which we thank you for this. And we are able to do a sustainable um, session with the uh, internal security forces on sustainable hunting and hunting law. Uh, we have over six meetings with local authorities to ensure support and uh, for our work because we work all over Lebanon and having the support of the local authorities from the municipalities and municipal police really had the, really the upper hand on us and supported us on apprehending poachers and or raising awareness to poachers because many of these poachers are from the local community. Thus having these local authority supporting us, it was really a, benefit, uh, a key and cornerstone in terms of er 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 radically decreasing the level of IKB in all over Lebanon. And specifically along the flyway, Hala, in a bit we'll tell you where specifically this added value was done. Finally, on the stakeholder mapping, mapping and communication, we were able to, there was an ongoing communication with the internal security forces, the environmental judges, and thus bridging the gaps because uh, periodically we meet environmental judges and really check up on the cases that were, have been raised 
by the APU regarding uh, breaking of uh, environmental law or the hunting law. Thus, for the anti-poaching reconnaissance, uh, as I mentioned, we have done over 70 missions, thus over 25,000 kilometers, and the removal of over six kilometers of nets uh, till now, without counting the this uh, autumn uh, 2022 migration rescue, uh, we have able we're able to reach over 25 to 30 bird rescue, and now we are still in the rehabilitation of over basically uh, eight uh, birds within our avian. Some of these field activities as seen from the images, from bird uh, transportation to uh, rehab and to removal of uh, for sustainable hunting and the hunting law awareness session, we were able to do over 16 sessions, reaching over 258 hunters, over four governor rates out of the seven. And we have able to do as ISF meeting and I, within the ISF publications, we have our own articles. We we're able to do wildlife uh, photography. Uh, bird watching in the knee, which was a black spot, a really, really, really major black spot. And to be honest, we were able to open a bird watching site in the place of the black spot. We were able to identify and really name a safe aviary or a safe haven, a safe passage in Irbe in Kisirwen area with over 33 participants who majority were poachers before that. And now they are the protectors of these areas. Uh, from the first image, it is Irbe. Second image on the right, it is uh, Adoniye. Third image is one of the trainings we had with local authorities in Kisirwen, and on the right side, it is wildlife photography training. We have done some wildlife photography. With the local authority, we have done many meetings with the Minister of Environment, I mean, uh, with the General Director of Internal Security Forces, who first of gave us the green light to do uh, what is necessary to apprehend poachers, and thus, we technically now, we have two fully functional ISF vehicles, 4x4 vehicles, simply for environmental and specifically for IKB cases under our uh, jurisdiction. Uh, we worked with several municipalities to ban hunting and regulate. So basically from this image as well, or this uh, slide specifically, we can see the images that are taken with the Director General of ISF. And basic Director of General of ISF he gave us the green light uh, and his full, 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 full support to uh, work with the hunters because this is kind of a, a social responsibility undertaken under uh, on ourselves and with the support of ISF we will be working together to really better implement the new hunting law which is it should be adapted a period uh, basically on a yearly basis and given the fact already ISF is uh, stretch uh, thin it's an all, all over the table having us as hunters as a frontliner, we really have a bigger impact because having an ISF officer coming forward and discussing with the the poacher is gonna it will be perceived differently when a hunter talks to a hunter. They know the language, you know how they think, how they act, why they will doing they are doing this. Another image is basically with the Ministry of Environment. The third image is with the uh, with the Bika municipality, and the fourth image is the. The document ran by the uh, Ka municipality for banning hunting. I really thank you for your time and listening to this presentation. And uh, hopefully, we'll be working together more and more in terms of uh, diminishing even further IKB cases in Lebanon. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Emir Danov, and I'm a PhD student in a Polish university. Also, I'm involved in a new life Egyptian voucher project as a field assistant. Uh, today, I will speak about for our next garden campaign. During the rapid population decline of the Egyptian voucher for decades, intensive conservation management has been applied in the last 10 years, aiming to help and even reverse the population trend. The Balkans is a region where only one of 10 juveniles survive until maturity. Hence, considering the value of each bird, we start a nest guardian campaign to recruit volunteers to guard Egyptian vulture nests during the fledgling period. This period is very stressful for juvenile birds and may have a little outcome. The aim of the nest guardian campaign is to save juveniles that fail to successfully accomplish their first flight. To use the saved birds in a breeding program that feeds the restocking program from the species in Bulgaria. To raise awareness among the people by the importance of a vouchers in ecosystem and human life. We started with the nest guarding campaign in the fledgling period as a conservation tool between 2013-2022. Uh, 
The period is essential to many juveniles and every year we have volunteers from abroad or nationals recruited to support that action and uh, supervise during the fledgling period to prevent loss of juveniles due to the weak fitness, predation, pet weather condition and so on. Each of these nests were observed during the daylight from a vantage point from August to mid-September. The observations start prior to the fledgling date of different individuals which was assessed by the monitoring of the population and finish off once the chick leave the nest successfully. The nest guarding starts early in the morning and ends at the end of the day. The nest guardians are equipped with binoculars and telescopes in order to look uh, for potential disturbance such as uh, people making loud noise close to the nest, people uh, resting under the nest cliff, treasure hunters, people climbing the, the cliff or performing any other activity that can affect the breeding. If a problem with a chick is observed, a rescue team is mobilized in order to find the lost chick and either return it in the nest or transport it to the rescue center if needs. Also the volunteers collect pivotal data on the behavior of the birds, their biology, their ecology, disturbance and not everything else relevant. The mean number of guarded nests of Egyptian vulture per year is 9 and total number for that period is 86. The total number of guarded fledglings is 123 which is 61% uh, of the fledglings in Eastern Rhodops. Most of the chicks left the nest naturally without no record incidents. However, 10 chicks were saved during that period. They were either extracted from the nest due to health or other problem or saved on the ground after unsuccessful first flight and then transported to the rescue center and only one chick was lost and found dead under the nest in 2017. In some cases the chicks were hesitant and spent the first one or two days close to the nest with less fly activity. However, they managed to fly successfully afterwards. The nest guardians managed to prevent cases of disturbance during the fledgling period, mostly caused by tourists. For all those years of our nest guarding campaign, we had 94 volunteers. They came from Bulgaria or abroad. Canada, Romania, Lithuania, Germany, Belgium, France, United Kingdom and United States and have taken part in the nest guarding. Thank you for your attention. Hi, hi everybody, my name is Dubromir Dovrev of the Bulgarian Society for the Protection of Birds and in this presentation I am going to speak about the methodology and the importance of the supplementary feeding stations in Bulgaria and our approach at BSPB. In the European Union and in Bulgaria, the legislation has been well adapted in respect to animal byproducts utilization and also voucher supplementary feedings based on mainly these two listed here, 1069 and 142. Supplementary feeding stations are an important management tool, especially when the population of the target species is saturated and is at low numbers, when the natural food in the area is scarce, in order to attract and keep vouchers in, in safe areas and also to decrease the risk of poisoning and secure safe food for vouchers. The location, how much and often food is provided are important to management of the supplementary feeding sites. Ideally, feeding sites should be located close to the voucher breeding territories and places where vouchers prefer to perch and roost. Supplementary feeding site selection is another important issue uh, when you establish such place, but it should be always based on vouchers preferences. In our case, the feeding site should be always away from any energetic power infrastructure, away from major roads and tourist trails, but at the same time close to a suitable purchase like rocks, 
the place must be wide and open so that vouchers can easy land and take off. And uh, of course, it should meet the VET requirements that we spoke about at the beginning of this presentation. Ultimately, we provide dead livestock animals collected from local farmers and offals from uh, slaughterhouses. However, there is there are food items that are uh, not suitable, like dead animals treated with antibiotics, carcasses treated with NSAIDs, uh, other carnivore species, or two decomposed carcasses. Nevertheless, the supplementary feeding does not replace animal byproducts final utilization according to the European legislation. In the Eastern Rodolfs, we have set a carcass collection system based on uh, work with local collaborators that we collect uh, dead animals from. Species specific feedings are very important in respect to voucher management and should be always considered. In the Eastern Rodops, we provide approximately 20 tons of food to vouchers. And the illustration gives a nice view how a regular feeding goes. In, in the majority of the cases, the griffon voucher, as the most abundant species in the area, will dominate the carcass. In this respect, and to give ch equal chances to other voucher species to take advantage of the provided food, we need a specific approach. In our case, we spread the carcass at different places at the feeding size so that we decrease the competition between the different voucher species. This is how we try to supplement uh, vouchers at our feeding sites in order to favor one or another voucher species. In these cases, and when food is not accumulated at one spot, griffon vouchers would not dominate it and scenarios voucher will easily reach to feed. We have a specific approach towards the Egyptian voucher by individually feeding pairs. In this respect, we provide small quantities of food, about two, three kilos, twice or three times per week, preferably in the early morning. We also uh, control the origin of the meat. Pairs subject to supplementary feedings are always selected based on the following criteria. Pairs with low breeding success in the previous years, pairs with partners replacement, new form pairs, pairs in areas with high risk of poisoning, and pairs that are easy to monitor. Find out more on our research and findings on the provided links. And thank you very much for your attention. That's the end of a long day. It was uh, very inspiring to hear about all the uh, mitigation measures uh, that were applied in the different parts of the species range. Uh, so now it's time for the last Q&A session of the day. Uh, we have a number of uh, questions already listed here um, and uh, some of the presenters are already in the room. Unfortunately, some others couldn't make it. Uh, so uh, the respective questions will be uh, answered uh, answered through emails. So the first question uh, goes to Liam. Uh, do you have a comprehensive GIS database with all the locations where flight diverters or insulators were installed in Germany? And could that be uh, correlated to a TSO map of incidents, hopefully showing fewer disruptions in areas with more refurbishment at the national level? Hi there. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so the short answer is no, we don't have such a comprehensive representation of all of the um, the actions that happened and the which presents such a clear correlation. We do have the map um, of all of the registrations of dead bird finds in Germany, and it does say when something followed directly. But to be honest, this is something that we've discussed with the grid operators on board, and many of them are reluctant to share this data in such a 
clear way because uh, of course, every time something is registered, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can follow this up with a mitigation measure. And so they're very, I'd say, skeptical about um, the public being able to uh, use this to criticise them for a lack of action. That being said, um, the point we recently held a conference in Germany and the point of data came up again and again and again, and we're very much on it. As I said in my presentation, um, we're focusing for now on bird markers, but from next year, we'll be looking a lot more into how to share data um, more openly, more comprehensively within Germany and at Europe, at European and international level. Um, and this, we hope, would include uh, bird presence, so kind of a broad sensitivity mapping, but also on uh, incidents and, uh, and retrofitting incidents. Um, and also to link together with other portals that are out there, because we've noticed that there's many initiatives which do similar things, but the data out there is very fragmented, which means that drawing any kind of scientific picture from uh, the data is, is, is really difficult. Thank you, Liam. Uh, the next one is a request from Richard Porter to Chris uh, to help with the Sokotra Egyptian Voucher Action Plan he would like to obtain the full list of NSAs and their trade names so uh, his colleagues can make full inquiries as to whether any are being used uh, that are not aware of. It would be great, okay. Chris, if you can. Okay, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thanks, Richard. And I can send you a list. In fact, that chart that I showed in my talk, I can send you that, although it doesn't give all the trade names <laughs> and I, I don't have that so readily available, but it can at least give you the, um, the list of the molecules that, that are the problem and or the, the various ones, safe and unsafe. So I'll, and that's, but it's also available on the SAVE website. There's the uh, um, save-vultures.org uh, and the NSAID uh, alert page on there, but but I'll, I'll send it to you. That's fine. Thanks. <clears throat> and Chris, there is another question to you. How were the eBirds data analyzed? Given that the number of eBirds submissions probably increased dramatically every year, it is very difficult to infer trends. Yeah, that's a big question um, and a great question. So using eBird trends, um, is problematic because because exactly of for that reason. But um, one of the thank thankfully we do have some calibration of that with uh, some data points in in Asia from the 1990s, and in fact the trends are from, from just despite those discrepancies in in um, uh, submissions more submissions now, the trends are remarkably um, consistent with that, but but we want to do more of that. Uh, but the um, State of India birds team actually did um, download all the data from from eBird and you, you can download the, um, the information as a spreadsheet and look at it, they've promised to tell me in more detail how they did it to, to pr produce those graphs, but it, it's not, not a difficult thing. And I, I think, Stefan, probably you, you would know how to do that. But yes, overcoming that, um, uh, the problem of, of, of more observers or, or different attention for vultures now than there would have been is, is something to keep in mind. Uh, one thing they are very, very um, concerned about is that we continue to do road transect surveys, which is the method that they're calibrating it against, so that we can continue to improve that calibration or uh, in future with uh, Asian vulture uh, populations. So we will be continuing that at least every three years in, in India. But thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And now we go to a question for, for Stella from Nigeria. Congrats for the amazing work done and progress achieved. 
Uh, do some of the traditional healers oppose the use of plant-based alternatives of uh, voucher body parts? And how do you deal with that? Okay, thank you, Volen, for that question. Um, definitely, there's there is some resistance from some party, but what we have noticed is that when you work with them as an association, and you continue to engage, um, what happens is you get to review the process and. Um, we've set up different WhatsApp group and other communication channels to consistently review the effectiveness of these alternatives that have been proposed um, to, so that you can periodically evaluate um, how it is accepted among these groups. So it is not, um, it's not just a one-time work. It is something that consistently needs to um, be visited and revisited until the message is totally embraced by these groups. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So there will be only one last question. And it's a question of Mike McGrady. Why is poultry forbidden as a food for supplementary feeding in Bulgaria? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. It is mainly forbidden because of the uh, bird transmitted diseases like you mean uh like we mean that these are mainly diseases that you know are uh, occurring birds so uh by default we should suspect that those diseases will be immediately transferred <clears throat> to the to the species that is consuming the food in this respect voucher species so this uh, this pose a hazard to the to the voucher so we never never dispose poultry to our vouchers and uh, yeah, and maybe uh, to answer another question I see here in the in the in the box uh, about the let me check out is the ah checking for lead uh, in wild animals. Uh, yeah, we we normally collect animals from uh, local farmers, etc. So uh, we never dispose or take animals that might be shot. I mean, these are mainly animals, uh, wild animals in most of the cases. And uh, we also know that vultures surely consume such animals. And we have investigated this issue in Bulgaria, and especially in the Eastern Rhodops. And uh, we have found that our vultures have a bit more elevated levels of lead. But uh, we have commented these reasons in a paper that we have published. Actually, it is a poster, and we have also already published a paper on the lead uh, intoxication with a griffon voucher from the Eastern Rhodops. So we can find out more there. Thanks, Dobri. Uh, thanks also to all the presenters that answered uh, some of the questions in the Q&A box. So you can uh, see uh, some of the answers also there. And uh, as we are running out of time, uh, it was a pleasure to meet you all and to to have you all in one room, even though it's a virtual room, not a real one. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we are hugely encouraged by the large number of people who have joined us today and hope that you will be able to join us again tomorrow. For tomorrow, we will start at uh, 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Greenwich time. And uh, you can join us through your timeline exactly as you did today. I'm delighted uh, of today's event. Uh, it has been such a successful, successful one. So I really hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, hope to see you all together full with uh, enthusiasm and more interesting uh, presentations to come. Have a nice evening, everyone. See you tomorrow. Uh, bye bye. Thank you. Bye.